you know, I think it's a mix of us choosing to show up and to keep showing up, you know, to keep loving people. Um, even if that means a 3 a.m. phone call, even if that means learning about the condition or the circumstance that they're living in or going through. Hi, friends. This is the Let's Give a Damn podcast, and I'm Nick LaPara. Thanks for choosing to listen to us right now, right in this very moment. There are a bajillion podcasts out there, and you came here. Thanks so much. I mean that from the bottom of my heart. There's been so much talk over the last few months and years about mental health, and I'm very glad this conversation is out there and happening in a big way right now, about how we can help each other, what to watch out for, and so on. So I thought it was high time to bring back this oldie but goodie episode with my friend and fantastic human, Jamie Twerkowski. Jamie started To Write Love on Her Arms, a nonprofit movement dedicated to presenting hope and finding help for people struggling with depression, addiction, self-injury, and suicide. They have been a beacon of hope for millions of people over the years, and they continue day after day after day to inspire, educate, and help so many. And the beautiful thing is that the work that Jamie and the team have done and are doing has made its way into the very inner circle of my life, people that I love very closely in my family and in my immediate community friends circle have tried to take their life and have been afflicted with depression and have harmed themselves in so many different ways. And Jamie and the team have come alongside them, maybe not in person, by the resources they create and the things they put out in the world have helped uh, people that I love. And so this is very near and dear to my heart. We first ran this episode on March 10 of 2017, just a few short months after bringing this podcast into the world to you. I hope you enjoy it. Let's go. I'm very honored to have you on. Uh, You're a dream guest for two reasons. One is I'm just plain grateful for what you do, the lives that have literally been saved and changed because you gave a damn and continue to is truly amazing. And uh, second, I'm coming at this, this is a interesting conversation because I'm coming at this from uh, kind of an outsider perspective, hoping to learn how to be more empathetic and loving for those experiencing depression, suicide of thought, self-harm and the like. Um, because, you know, we'll get into this more in the conversation, but I don't, I don't know what that's like. I have people very close in my life that do, but if, as I look back on my life, I don't know that I've, and I mean this honestly, unless I misunderstand what it is, I don't know that I've ever experienced depression in my life. I just am kind of an opposite. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I'm very, I'm coming at this very curiously and I'm super excited to talk to you. So thanks for joining us. Oh yeah. Thanks again for having me. Cool. Well, I'd like to get right into it. I'd like to actually reverse engineer our talk a little bit. If I may, let's start with what you do. And then later on in the conversation, we'll go into who you are, your story and your upbringing. Yeah. Um, So let's first talk about to write love on her arms. You didn't set out to start a nonprofit for what I understand. Um, So tell us how the whole thing started. So back in 2006, I was actually working as a sales rep for the clothing brand Hurley. And at the time, I I thought that was my dream job and thought that was going to be my career and my future. And I was introduced to a girl named Renee Yoey, uh, who quickly became a friend. And when I met Renee, she was struggling with drug addiction, depression, a history of self-injury, and we would later find out there had been multiple suicide attempts. And the friend that I was living with, his story involved addiction and recovery, and and he was in a very healthy place as I was getting to know him. And, And so he really became sort of a big brother to Renee, and she was denied entry into a local treatment center in Orlando and ended up living at the house that I was living at for the next five days. And essentially, we just kept her safe and passed that time. And for me, it was getting to know her, uh, learning her story. And all of this was way outside my realm of understanding or expertise. I'd, I'd never had conversations like this. And Somewhere inside that five days, uh, I asked, I think I was just really moved by the experience and what we were talking about and her story, which was one of, you know, a lot of pain, but also 
having hope that things could look different, that she could know healing, that she could find sobriety. And I asked her what she thought about the possibility of telling her story. And at the time, I think I was realizing that I enjoyed writing. And I, I certainly wouldn't have considered myself a writer. I didn't write for a magazine or a blog. Um, I just realized that I enjoyed that that way of communicating right. and would have understood if she said no or no way or get lost. But instead, she said she really loved the idea that maybe there could be a purpose for her pain, that maybe other people could be touched, could even be encouraged, that someone else would end up you know, stepping into treatment or, or stepping into professional help. And maybe, you know, some individual or even some family, you know, could be impacted in a positive way. And I ended up writing a story, called it To Write Love on Her Arms, posted it as a blog uh, back on, on MySpace. And mm -hmm. 2006 was really the beginning of social media becoming sort of mainstream and part of everyday right. life. And essentially that story went viral. We, we learned that so many people could relate to Renee's story, whether it was from their own personal experience or them writing in on behalf of a loved one, whether that was someone they had lost or someone who was still struggling now, and just realized very quickly that we were bumping into a much bigger conversation and, and maybe that you know I had the opportunity to do more than just help one person. Yeah, that's beautiful. Um... And so what has kind of what has kind of happened since then? Um, so that was 11 years ago, beginning of social media. What's kind of, yeah, what, what, how, yeah. how has this uh, developed? So we had a very surprising beginning just because of that story kind of taking on a life of its own. We, we quickly made T-shirts available. And at first, the T-shirts were sold to help pay for Renee's treatment. Uh, but again, pretty quickly realized we could, do more than just meet those needs. And mm. uh, a couple months later, a couple months after writing the story, because of the momentum and, and kind of the excitement surrounding, you know, this MySpace page and the story and the shirts, I ended up leaving my Hurley job and, you know, have been at it ever since. And so, you know, the, the, sh the short version is that for the first year, we were under the umbrella of another charity and that gave us sort of a big brother that we could lean on and, and learn from. Right. You know, it's one thing to tell a story. It's another thing to figure out, you know, what's a budget? What's a board of directors? How do you do this well? How do you make it sustainable? And back then, the question was me wondering if it could be a job for one person. And at the time, that was me. And now there's 14 of us that are full-time staff. We always have seven or eight interns who actually come to us from all over the world and put life on hold for a semester and go through training. Wow. And, and they're actually the ones who primarily continue this conversation on an individual basis, responding to emails and notes and letters. And, and then as an organization, we've been able to evolve with social media. And so we've you know, made the transition to, to Facebook and Tumblr and Instagram and uh, certainly our own website as well and continue to try to be a source of hope and encouragement for people, try to connect people to resources. We've given more than $1.6 million that's gone to treatment and recovery in the U.S. and elsewhere in the world as well. And I think more than anything, we just get to wake up every day and try to communicate this message that it's okay to be honest and it's okay mm. to ask for help. Yeah, that's amazing. I wish more people were doing that and talking that way. So can you share a few one or two stories like I guess I'm wondering is there anything that comes to your mind how, how can we see the outworking of this like you know when, when people contact you call you whatever what are some of the examples of some of the things they're dealing with and then how can you guys help yeah, them yeah. recover from that get out of that sure so it's interesting because the things that we hear have not changed all that much you know in the mm -hmm. last decade plus some of the original responses to Renee's story are the same things we read and and hear today and so it might be someone struggling with depression whether they use that word or not you know talking right. about life feeling very difficult or, or you know this sadness or sorrow that they can't seem to shake people feeling stuck uh, we hear from people 
struggling with addiction. Maybe that is their addiction or it's addiction that that impacts their family or someone they care about. You know, we hear from people who have lost a loved one to suicide and they're trying to cope and they're trying to move forward, you know, in that grief. And, th- you know, those are some simple examples. And I think ultimately everything we do comes back to this question of what do I do with my pain? You know, how do I cope with the things yeah. that I wish were different in my life? And, you know, certainly for all of us on different levels, we relate to that question and we kind of answer mm-hmm. it every day. And certainly there's really healthy ways to cope and there's unhealthy ways of coping. And, you know, my guess is most of us do a bit of both. And and so, you know, more than anything, we we try to point away from ourselves. So we're not pointing to the organization as a final solution, but you know, for us success means someone who took a step in our direction, taking another step in the direction of having honest conversations with people close to them. And then probably more than anything, just people ending up sitting across from a counselor for the first time or stepping into treatment if they need that kind of help. So it's really this mix of, community and professional help that we point to how do you help people become okay with talking about their shit like we've all got it we all have these things that haunt us you know in it's a wide spectrum of things right none of us deal with the same thing in the same way but how do you I've, i've always tried to live that way and encourage other people to live very honestly because you know we all try to put on this front especially on social media you know we always talk about where everybody puts their highlight reel there yeah. and then we compare it to our blooper reel and we feel like bad about ourselves yeah so how, how do you personally as a leader as the founder of this organization but also as an organization organization help people become true authentic um yeah just sharing the bad hurtful hard things that are happening in life yeah. well i think there's a lot of freedom in vulnerability and you know what i've even experienced in my own life is that it's a lot harder to live with a secret. It's a lot harder Mm. to live, you know, with a bunch of shame or a bunch of pain and to try to keep it all in. And as you said, to kind of keep it hidden. And so, and I think too, because we're constantly pushing that, I think we present it as an option to people. And um, I think, you know, people might take a small step in our direction, whether that's sending an email or even responding, you know, maybe it's a comment on our blog. But I think as people begin to open up and begin to be honest, it it feels really good. And mm-hmm. I think also they they see other people doing that, you know, and hopefully they see us posting stories of people doing that, of people choosing to be honest about their pain and, and people pursuing recovery. And and so I think it, you know, it, it it just feels good. And hopefully that first step, which is maybe the hardest to take, you know, leads to a second and third and and fourth step. And, you know, I think even going to counseling can be a really good example because that first appointment, that first time walking into a counseling office, that can be really intimidating. That might be way outside someone's comfort zone. But I think over time, people realize, wow, this feels like the most important hour Mm -hmm. of my week. Um, not that it's easy or super fun, but there's a sense of progress and ultimately the feeling that it's worth it. And so I think as we present, you know, this idea of honesty and vulnerability, uh, I like to say that, Hey, this isn't easy, but we do believe that it's worth it. I love that. I read a statistic, uh, and it might be totally off. It might be too conservative, too liberal. I don't know, but I read a statistic that 15 million Americans that are 18 or older suffer from depression specifically. So that's not even counting the suicidal thoughts, self-harm, addiction. That's like one in 20 people in this country. And that's, my guess is it's more than that. And that's not including 18 and younger, which I've seen a lot of that in that age group um, as I've, you know, as I've met more people and been in more uh, circles of influence. So that's a lot of people and a lot of people listening so my guess is a lot of people listening are also suffering from this in in some way. What do you tell people? Like, is is this is this something that people can? Let's take depression for instance. And again, I'm curious here. Can people c- control this, or is it something? Is it more like now you have it? 
here's how to deal with it. Like, what what do you guys do in terms of approaching that, uh, counseling people with steps forward? Yeah, you know, so I'm obviously someone doing this work and and in a way leading this work, but I'm also yeah. someone who struggles with depression, and I hmm. have had seasons of sitting across from a counselor once a week. Last year, last May, for the first time, I went away for a week of therapy. You know, they told us that it was a year's worth of therapy in a week because we basically mm. did nothing else. I have been on antidepressants for the last five or six years. And and so for me, it, it's ongoing. And, and I don't know, I don't know if that'll, you know, magically not be in my life someday. And in a way, I don't give that a ton of thought because I, I think I, I kind of just try to live it one day at a time. Um, and, you know, for some people it, it, you know, we've heard stories where it's a lifelong battle and for other people, they have this tremendous recovery and maybe their depression was uniquely tied to a circumstance. You know, maybe it was a loss or a heartache um, and over time, they get to a place where they feel a lot healthier and a lot happier. So I think we don't want to make a blanket statement about that. Um, I think we just encourage people to look at where they are and to get whatever help they need for however long they need it. And so, you know, I, I've had, I always say these seasons of sitting across, across from a counselor, which, which tends to be, you know, for a few months and, I think my depression is always there on some level, but I, I do the counseling for as long as I feel like I really need it, and then I'm able to step away. And then I also know that if if I start to struggle again or if something happens, that, that I can take that step. Um, you know, I used to take the lowest dose of the antidepressant that I'm on, and last year I went through a really hard breakup, and sat with my doctor and, and talked to him about upping the dose and ended up doing that. And, you know, there's no shame. There's no, hmm. there's nothing awkward for me at this point saying those things because they really just feel like tools that have brought some stability to my life. Thank you. That's, that's very, um, that's very helpful. Yeah. Um, so one more question of this sort before we go back into your story a little bit. So I, I had a friend, quick story. I had a friend, I grew up in Guatemala. My parents were missionaries there. And I had a friend, her name was Jimena, and she was this jolly, happy, just this pleasant person to be around, was one of our very close friends. And we took karate classes together. And one day, she didn't come. And she had, we found out later that she tried to poison her whole family. And she ended up, she tried to poison everybody, including herself. She succeeded with herself. And her family, they were able to, it was like food poisoning. She tried to like poison their food and they were able to recover from it with, you know, going to the hospital, but she, she died. That messed me up because for one, she was a really close friend and there was no goodbye. There was no wrapping things up. There was no anything. Sure. And on top of that, no one, no one knew. No one could tell that she was obviously in a huge amount of pain Enough, and she wasn't. It was nothing psychological or mental. She was completely all there all the time, and then one day she wasn't. And so, I guess what I'm asking is, in your experience, and I'm sorry for all these types of questions, but I'm just very curious. In your experience, how can we, for the people that do show signs of depression or self harm or suicidal thoughts, like how can we help? Like how can we come alongside them? And also, are there any things that we should look for? Um, because there was no, there were no signs with her. No yeah. one knew, not her parents, not her brothers, not her sister, nothing. And then she was gone one day. Yeah. So I know it's a big question, but yeah, how would you help me and the audience? Yeah, no. Um, so I think in terms of, in terms of signs, uh, you know, something that we've heard and learned over the years is that depression is often something that sort of touches every part of life and you know it, it affects us socially physically emotionally spiritually um, and so if you see someone's behavior change for an extended amount of time you know I think when you really know someone 
at least to the best that you can, you can mm-hmm. tell when they're off or different, right? You, you, you at least maybe have a sense of, hey, they're quiet or they're, they're isolating. They're kind of hiding out. I haven't seen them as much. Um, I think as a, when there's trust built and there's a relationship, you can express that and you can ask someone, hey, are, are you okay and the hard thing, and I think you experienced, is you can't control the response that you're met with, right? You you can't right. make them be entirely honest. You can't make them tell you everything. Um, but we can control our action as a friend or as a loved one. You know, we can control whether or not we keep showing up. And, um, you know, so I think there's there's all sorts of, of little indicators at times. I mean, I think... Your story represents a lot of people who, you know, end up hearing the news of a suicide and feel like they knew someone pretty well and were so blindsided by it. And, and, and so I think it's fair to acknowledge that, that, that so oftentimes we feel like we don't know. But I think we have to look at, you know, whatever, whatever signs or red flags or indicators might be there. And um, maybe it's a situation that's less extreme you know maybe suicide is not on the table but maybe it's just someone who's struggling even if they're struggling for you know through a breakup or something pretty typical um i think when we really know people we we earn the right to speak up in their lives and we earn the right to ask questions and essentially to ask people how they're really doing and in terms of advice i think i think you asked about that you know i think it's a mix of us choosing to show up and to keep showing up, you know, to keep loving people. Um, even if that means a 3 a.m. phone call, even if that means learning about the condition or the circumstance that they're living in or going through. And then more than anything, I think it's just trying to be a bridge to professional help. So not, not thinking that we, the friend or the brother or sister or boyfriend or girlfriend, not thinking that we have to be the hero, but knowing that there's people that have devoted their lives and certainly their careers to doing this unique work. And and so we end up sounding like a broken record, just encouraging people to sit with a counselor um, and knowing that that more often than not is a great place to start, even if they need other help after that or more help or a unique form of treatment, a good counselor can help someone begin to make those decisions and begin to process what they're going through. And so I think when you, encounter someone who's really struggling, um, whether that's depression, whether it's grief, we love to point to counseling. You know, in my mind, it's, it's not so different from if your car is, you know, if the check engine light comes on, you take it to someone who works on cars because that's what they do and that's what they know. Um, you know, if you can't stop coughing, you, you go see the doctor and you talk about that. And so when it comes to mental health, we don't think it should be any different where, you know, if, if essentially that check engine light is on, you, you got to go talk to someone who, who understands how and why these things happen. Yeah, I love that check engine analogy because what happens when we don't go get it checked out? Like something bigger happens later. Yeah, definitely. Uh, because we didn't, the symptom, it was like something was popping up saying, please check me out. And when we don't go give that thing help, it can turn into something much bigger. Yeah. Much- and I think... I think it's important to acknowledge, um, and I actually go back to my friend Renee as an example, that some of it is timing and there's this, you know, control is such a hard one because we want to control the response of the person we care about, right? We want them to hear our loving words. We want them to take our advice because we want them to be okay. And yet we can't control anyone else's actions or behavior and so I think it's important for people to have grace, you know, that I, I think I've heard Renee say that there were people who told her the truth and gave her good advice for months and maybe years before I ever even met her. Hmm. And it's not that those people did anything wrong or that I did something great or right. Some of it was the timing that she finally got to a place of wanting that help. And uh, something I've heard over the years that is is a little bit maybe surprising or counterintuitive is if you're trying to carry the burden of someone who's struggling, it's important that 
that you have a support system. You know, obviously you want them to have a support system and you want them to get help. But sometimes we forget about taking care of ourselves. And so if, yes. you know, if there's someone in your life and you're really concerned, you know, and, and you're, you're carrying the weight of that, we like to encourage someone to maybe you talk to a counselor about that because that's a lot for you to carry as well. That's huge. That's a really important point. And I love your earlier, you, you defined love as showing up. And I recently did an interview um, where I was being interviewed, kind of the tables turned and and they asked that question, like, what is love for you? And the the very first and only thing that comes to my mind is like, number one spot is showing up. Yeah. Because you've got to keep coming back. We We don't, whether it's my wife or my children or my friends or people that are part of my my neighbor community or my church community, like we don't get to decide when it clicks for them, whatever that thing is. And so we have to just keep coming back. And the people in our life have to keep going back to us because we're not perfect by any stretch. And so, you know, they need to keep pursuing us until it clicks with whatever that thing that needs to click is. So I really love, really love that definition. Um, Let's keep moving. Uh, Let's go back to the beginning for uh, a moment. Tell me about... Tell me about your upbringing, your family, really anything that would give us a peek into the things that happened or that, that made you the way you are today, a person that d- gave dams about <laughs> Renee and so many others since. You probably could have had other career paths, like at Hurley. Yeah. You could be the, a VP at Hurley <laughs> by now, and you're not. You're, you're running this organization. So what does that look like? Um, you know, I think the first thing that comes to mind is I grew up with really loving parents. I I grew up in a really compassionate home. Um, I think there's evidence that I was kind of always a sensitive kid. I was always um, someone who was aware of other people's pain, someone who felt things deeply and even, you know, felt my own pain deeply. And uh, so I guess there was, you know, kind of some signs of sensitivity and empathy from an early age. Uh, My parents were always really great at, not just caring about the needs of our family, but trying to care and, and meet the needs that they became aware of, you know, even in our community. And so I think I just saw compassion modeled from the time that I was little. And, um, and then it's funny, you know, there's a bunch of other dots that connect. My dad was a sales rep. I went on to be a sales rep. I kind of grew up in love with these clothing brands in the surf industry my dad loves music. He shared music with me. You know, I became someone who loved music and all of these things have found their way into the work that I do today. You know, so it's not just compassion, but there's this element of t-shirts and there's the, you know, the influence and collaboration with, with people who make music. So I I heard my mom say years ago that this organization now, it's kind of everything I ever learned about, everything I showed interest in, you know, my whole life. Um, and, and then, you know, I, I kind of dreamed about working for one of those surf companies and ended up getting my foot in the door and ended up kind of getting the job I thought was my dream. And part of it, you know, it, it was cool from a distance. The money was good. The freedom was good. I joke that my friends had free Hurley clothes, so it was good for them. <laughs> but something felt like it was missing. Like just something felt a little bit empty for me. And, um, I, you know, I just, just felt like I wasn't a great fit as a person who ultimately, you know, was driving around by myself doing sales. And I think I was interested in things that were more creative. And, and then beyond that, I think just things that felt more meaningful, you know, just, just caring about people and, and their pain. And uh, I actually lost a friend, a coworker at Hurley. He died by suicide about a month before I met Renee. And I remember in a way, I think that was an important seed that was planted because I just wrestled with how could Hurley as a company respond to the, to my friend's death and kind of wishing that I was in a position, you know, that I had the influence or the decision-making to speak into that. Um, and, you know, interestingly enough, I, I couldn't decide what Hurley did or if Hurley did anything, but I think I started to dream about a brand that could really go there and that could really talk about difficult things and talk about pain and hope and preventing suicide. And, um, 
you know, it, it's, it's wild the way it all went because I met Renee and tried to help her and, you know, and it, more than anything, it's an organization, but, but I'm okay with saying it's a brand as well. And so all of those things, I think, you know, played a part in what I get to do today. That's really awesome. Thanks for sharing that. I'm sure the journey's not been easy. Uh, no journey ever is. And so as you have been, have you, as you have poured yourself out for this organization and people over the last 11 years, uh, what, are, what have been some of the ups and downs? I want to, as I tell these stories, there's hard parts, there's really good parts. I want to always uh, reassure people that if they decide to go all in, and be others centered in a really big way, more than just like a thing that they add to their lives. But like you've done, like this is your life. I want to remind people that it's not always going to be great and sexy. Like it looks sure. like on the Instagram photos or, Oh, Jamie's off speaking here and doing that. And he's in Iraq with preemptive love. And you know, it, it looks good on uh, paper as it were on, on social media, but it's not always like that. There are hardships. So is there anything you could share that would just uh, give us a reality check? Yeah. Um, I think the early years, especially there were a lot of growing pains, you know, this was all so far outside of my realm of expertise. You know, I definitely didn't grow up dreaming or even thinking about starting a nonprofit or leading a nonprofit. And so there was so much to learn and, um, you know, just getting this thing off the ground. I, I like to point out in a way we started backwards because we had attention coming our way and we had money coming in before we had a plan before we and I say we but it was really me back then <laughs> um right knew what we were doing and you know I, I think looking back I, I wish I would have known that it was totally okay to it to just say I don't know to say mm -hmm. I need help I need more help um and and I think some, you know I don't beat myself up for it but I there was just a, I guess, growing pains tends to be the, you know, the phrase that sticks. And um, I think too, just learning the value of relationships. I, I've worked with some of my closest friends over the years and, and thankfully, you know, most of those friendships are intact. Um, but there were definitely times when those relationships felt strained or fractured. Um, it can be great to work with people you love and and it can also be really hard because there's a lot at stake um, and also just kind of the irony of um, being known for compassion and kindness and treating people really well publicly and then having you know to to sort of wrestle through okay what does it look like to lead a team to be part of a staff mm -hmm. um, to think about others, not just in a public way, but even in a everyday work setting. You know, what does it look like to care for the people who moved to Florida to join, to join our team? What does it look like to spend time with our interns and things that happen quietly? You know, um, you know, I I grew up and had had friends. I never really had enemies. I was always, I don't know, had it pretty easy, and then. And then I remember stumbling into this and for the first time there were people saying things online, you know, people questioning my motives and people spreading rumors and, and some, some of that was really hard, just dealing with criticism and, and, you know, just kind of seeing, we get to see the best of social media and the internet, but at, at right. times we see the other side. Um, and then ultimately I think some of that, some of that has just gotten easier over the years. I think I've done some growing up. You know, I, I was 26 when this started. I'm 37 now. Uh, I think we've been able to build a team and um, learn from a lot of good people and figure out how to get organized and how to do this in a way that's sustainable. Uh, and then maybe the last bit is just just taking my own advice. You know, it's one thing to stand on a stage and tell everyone it's okay to go to counseling or it's okay to take medicine. And it's something else entirely to do that in my own life. And, and sure. that's been part of my journey along the way. As we begin to wrap up, let's get practical for one minute. Not that that wasn't practical, but as you know, everyone that's listening, I hope they're listening to this, not just to hear some great story about Jamie and to write love on her arms, 
but they want to they want to as well become agents of change in their community. They want to give a damn about the people, places, and things around them. Can you give two or three practical steps for our listeners about how they can begin to do that, both just in general, but also specifically with the things that you deal with, with people that are depressed, suicidal, addicted, and so on and so forth. Do you have any practical steps you can give? Yeah, definitely. You know, I get asked a lot, some form of that question. And I think sometimes people look at what we're doing and they see some of the biggest moments or, you know, some of the metrics and they think, hey, you're doing something big. How do I do something big? And it feels really important and really healthy to remind people that this started small. It started about as small as something could in terms of trying to help one person and after that trying to tell one story. And I love that humble beginning. You know, there was no yes. whiteboard, there was no business plan, there was no five year plan. It, it wasn't even meant to be a charity. And so, you know, this was just a, a situation that kind of fell into my life. And, you know, basically because of the house that I was living at, the friend that I was renting a room from. And, and so I love to just encourage and maybe even challenge people to see the value in the everyday, to see the value in things that might be seemingly small, you know? So I can, I can really only point to my own experience, but, you know, whoever would have thought that meeting one person and having a series of conversations would lead to all of this, you know, you, I never could have known or imagined that. Um, and I, I just love to tell people, you know, figure out what moves you, figure out what breaks your heart, figure out the needs that exist, you know, maybe in your own life, in your own family, in your own community, and start there. I think a lot of people, a lot of us feel powerless or like we can't do something big or, you know, we, or almost like it doesn't count unless the news shows up. And, and I, I don't think that's true. You know, I think everyone has some, some degree of influence. If, if you have anyone in your life who listens to you, if you have anyone in your life who follows you on social media, you have some influence, you know, um, your family, your coworkers, your roommates. Uh, and I think a lot of times people forget that they have that influence. And, and so I, I love to just encourage people to start small. You know, if, if you're a college student and you don't have any money and, and you feel busy, you don't have a lot of free time, you know, start with, Start with your campus. Start with yeah. your heck the the building that you live in, <laughs> you know, um, and you never know where all of that could go. And I don't I don't think I don't think it should be done with an agenda. You know, I if I had met Renee and in the back of my mind was wondering if someone would make a movie about it one day, um, you know that that was nowhere in the equation. And and so I I just think we're we're called to not only tell good stories, but live good stories. And then I think we don't have a ton of control over what takes off or, or you know, when the news cameras show up. Um, and maybe that stuff's not that important and not really an indicator of if we're doing something that matters. You know, I think we're just supposed to love people well and be brave and be creative and, you know, try to use our hearts and use our minds and and I think then you just you never know what it's going to lead to, right? You never know how it might impact your career. Um, and then maybe the last bit is I just I love to encourage people to to try to do a job where you get to bring your heart to work. You know, life mm. is too short to you know spend twenty or thirty years doing a job that you hate. And you know, I'm really thankful and I'm aware that it's unusual and it's a privilege to get to do something I love. But when it comes to young people who are trying to make decisions about the future and choosing majors, I just love to encourage people not to not to play it safe, you know, but to try to do something that feels meaningful and to try to do things you care about and, you know, to take some chances. Probably the, you know, maybe the biggest moment for me career-wise was quitting that Hurley job. And not everyone agreed with it. Not everyone understood but I had to take that risk to get to do everything I do now. Super helpful. Um, 
Where is where is Renee now? I hope that's not a, a oh, inappropriate question no, 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 to ask, but I, I, that's totally I'm kind of cool. wondering like what whatever happened yeah, to Renee. Yeah. No, that's a we get that a lot, and that that makes sense. Um, she was living in Nashville for a few years, and now she's living back in Orlando. And uh, I usually answer it in a couple ways. So there's lots of good news. You know, there's lots of highlights. She wrote a book called Purpose for the Pain. She has a, a music project called Bearcat. You know, she released an EP. Uh, we've, we have had and still get opportunities to do events together. For a while, she would speak, you know, just kind of tell her story in a more traditional way. And over time, she realized she preferred to tell it in the form of songs. And obviously, there's a little bit of speaking in between the songs. Uh, maybe the biggest moment related to her was when the To Write Love on Her Arms movie came out. So, Kat Dennings plays Renee in this film, and that was certainly a, you know, who would have thought moment. Um, and then with that, I think she would say that life has been really hard, and and recovery has been really hard, and it hasn't been perfect. It hasn't been a fairy tale. There's been relapses. You know, there's been really difficult seasons. Even with her and I, in terms of our friendship, there's been difficult seasons, and and you know, honestly, entire years where we had trouble communicating, but she's in a really good place right now. She's really healthy. She's pursuing sobriety. Um, and then she, she's definitely not super hidden. You know, she's on Twitter. She, she has a blog. Uh, I always just encourage people to, you know, look for her name online. It's Renee, R E N E E. And her last name is Yoe, Y O H E. Um, and so she's a really gifted communicator, super creative. You know, I mentioned music. She's a great writer as well. And uh, she, she's not, you know, full time with the organization or anything like that. Obviously, she'll always be connected to what we do. She'll always have a really, you know, vital place in our story. Uh, but it feels really healthy for her to just be an individual and for us to do what we can to support whatever it is that she's doing you know and, and over the years that's been speaking and music and jewelry and uh we love to cheer her on and you know we're grateful that she seems to cheer us on as well um so yeah she's she's doing well but it feels it feels important to let people know that that doesn't mean it's just been 11 years of sobriety or 11 years of awesome it's it's been a roller coaster but more than anything i'm i'm really thankful for where she's at now Love that. Thank you for sharing. Before, Jamie, before I ask the last question, I just want to take a moment to honor you for your work, your heart, your passion for hurting people, and ultimately your contribution to the world that has inspired and helped so many. Uh, I love that you've dedicated your life and your career to making the world a better place. I have heard, you know, your voice you know, online, TED, TED Talks and so on. And now I'm hearing it. I just, I feel like there's a lot of compassion and love and care in your voice. And I really am grateful that you, like literally your physical voice, and I'm really grateful that you get to use that to really help people. Um, I don't have the luxury of that. Sometimes I, uh, I'm a very passionate person. Sometimes I am very intimidating in how I come across. But you, yeah, there's something about you that this is the perfect role and job for you. So I'm just really grateful for you, and I want to honor you for that. Oh, thanks, Nick. That Those are really kind words, and, and that means a lot. I, I totally appreciate that. Yeah, no, you're welcome. I mean all of that. Okay, last question. It's a hypothetical. Um, you're going to die someday, and when you die, I promise it gets better, uh, <laughs> when you die, which hopefully won't be for many, many years, I'm going to give your eulogy. And... All your friends, your fans, everybody that appreciates your work and your life, any everybody you've impacted is there. In three to four sentences, what do you want me to say? Like, what do you want your legacy to be? Oh, man. Um, oh, that's a really good question. I don't think I've been asked that. Um, no, I just, you know, I'd want my friends and family to feel like I loved them well. You know, my probably one of my favorite things in my whole life, if not, you know, the top of the list is being an uncle to my nephews and they don't know if I'm successful. They don't know if I'm verified on Twitter. They don't know what any of that means. <laughs> um, I think they just know that I love them and that I, I keep showing up, you know? And so I, you know, we, we kind of use that phrase, but I, 
I hope the people that I have real relationships with would feel like I cared for them well. And, um, you know, and then beyond that, you know, if I, if I was able to inspire some people and encourage people, probably the best compliment I ever get to hear is someone saying they're, they ended up getting help because of Hmm. to write love or, or even maybe something that I read or, or they heard at an event. Um, so yeah, you know, I, I, I feel like I get, I'm kind of all heart and I get to show people my heart and try to share that. And, you know, I, I hope that can be my legacy. Um, that's, that's probably more than four sentences, but <laughs> that's totally fine. And if, if, if that's what's said on, on, on that day, I think uh, job well done, man. <laughs> thanks man. That's a great question. Uh, Jamie, thanks for joining me today. This was a lot of fun. I'm glad uh, to have you on. Oh, thanks Nick. Thanks for having me. Friends, before I wrap this episode up, here's my challenge to you for this week. Right now, you know at least one person struggling with depression, addiction, self-injury, or suicidal thoughts, actions. Chances are there are several people in your community circle, your immediate community circle right now. So check in with a few folks today. Maybe it's the obvious friend that looks down and out and isn't doing well, but chances are it's a friend that looks like they have their shit together. I know this from personal experience. So check in. Let your friends know that you love them and that you're always available for anything they need. Sometimes that's all it takes. To find more information about this podcast conversation and Let's Give a Damn in general, go to podcast.letsgiveadamn.com. If you love what we're doing on the show, tell a friend. Maybe leave us a five-star rating and review on Apple Podcasts. Or consider giving us a few dollars each month to support the production and execution of this show by going to patreon.com slash let's give a damn. The Patreon has been sort of stagnant for a while. I'll be completely honest with you because we're family. I actually lost someone this month that was giving us $10 per month. I'm not sure why. Much love to her or him. I don't want to give it away. Not that you would ever find out who he or she is. I appreciate that person so much for giving to us for a very long time, but we lost that person. And I just share that to say this. I try not to put ads on here because I hate them. I I listen to tons of podcasts and I hate the ads each and every time. Well, not every time, but 99% of the time. But it costs me hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of dollars each month to bake this podcast for you. If you wouldn't mind giving us one cup of coffee per month, or not an actual cup of coffee, I can make or buy my own coffee, but uh, the equivalent of a cup of coffee to continue making this podcast, please send that money our way by visiting patreon.com slash let's give a damn. This podcast, as always, was edited and produced by the incredible Chad Snavely. The music is by our friend Propaganda. See you all next week. Peace.